Dr. Mark Skousen is a professor of economics at Rollins College in beautiful Winter Park, Florida. Love it. Can't get enough of uh, going to Winter Park. Um, Mark Skousen uh, worked for the CIA as an economic analysis analyst uh, before starting his own company and becoming famous in the world of investment and financial privacy advising. He's written widely in this area, most notably his complete guide to financial privacy, uh, playing the price control game, how some people will profit from the coming controls, and closing the door, the end of financial privacy in America. And he is also um, writes a very successful uh, investment newsletter called Forecast and Strategies, and he has made many important academic contributions as well, including the 100% gold standard, the economics of a pure commodity money, uh, the Structure of Production, which is published by New York University Press, uh, Economics on Trial, The Lies, Myths, and Realities, and I think most recently, The Descent on Keynes, uh, a collection of critical appraisals of Keynesian economics. Uh, and you'll find his writings just about every place else, including publications of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. So I'm <coughs> very pleased to welcome uh, Mark Skousen to Auburn University, and I uh, look forward to his discussion of how the economics profession has gone wrong. Aha, uh -huh. good question. So the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, it is a delight to be here uh, at Auburn for the first time, and uh, actually what I'd like to talk about is on a more positive uh, uh, side of it, uh, given that the uh, I think the profession has gone down the, uh, the wrong road in many directions, particularly in the way economics is taught, at the college level. Um, I'm working on a project right now uh, called Economic Logic, which is a, uh, a new textbook, and uh, uh, introductory textbook on the college level. And uh, I, uh, my approach is very different from the way economics is taught. Um, and uh, so I would like to mm, if I may spend time showing you what I'm doing and get your reaction to this. Lou, how are you? Good to see you. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, I think in explaining uh, what I'm trying to do in this textbook, Economic Logic, uh, you will see why I have problems with the way economics is presented to students uh, today. Um, so uh, uh, let me uh, first say that I worked a long time on the title to try to get the title right. Uh, I want to emphasize the logical approach that I'm trying to take in economics. And I don't think economics is taught in a logical fashion right now. I, I think students would have a difficult time predicting what the next chapter will be in a textbook uh, because they, they just are not predictable. You don't know whether it's micro first or macro. Uh, you, you don't know when government is going to be introduced. Uh, it, it really is, I think, in a lot of ways, a, a hodgepodge of throwing a little out here, a little out there. And what I've tried to do is develop a simple to complex, logical step-by-step -step introduction to economics uh, that will... Uh, be presented in a way that students can understand and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. It's common sense from the beginning to the end. Although the conclusions, when you're finished with the course, are, may often be surprising, which is what happens a lot in economics. Uh, so uh, my first part uh, of the, uh, of the uh, textbook, and I've done about six chapters, in the book uh, is uh, I basically rely on a lot of Austrian concepts that were developed from uh, Menger and from Barwerk and Mises and Hayek and I rely particularly on Hayek's triangles uh, to develop uh, a logical model. However, I think the problem with Hayek, if you're familiar with his book Prices and Production, which introduced the stages of production concept, uh, is that he, he always dealt only on a theoretical level and never on a practical level. And my experience in the business world, I think, has been very helpful to take Hayek's basic 
time structure, structural model, and put it into a practical uh, context. And uh, so, I guess I don't have a blackboard here. That actually, I should have asked for that. That would have been helpful. But uh, uh, maybe you can just see here. Um, the four-stage model that I've developed here. I don't know how many have seen this before. I, I've used it a number of times in my Economics on Trial book and in my um, Structure of Production book. But basically, you have four stages of production. You start with natural resources, and then you have manufacturing and semi-manufacturing, and then you have the wholesale trade, marketing uh, part of the business, and then finally you have consumer goods and services. And you notice each stage gets larger uh, as you add value. Now, to me, you see, this is one thing Hayek never did. Even though he had the tri uh, what you would call a triangle, but the, the steps, if you will, um, he never identified them, as I've done here. And I've identified these because they fit very nicely in the government statistics on, uh, like on prices, you can get commodity price index, uh, you can get a, uh, um, a producer price index, you can get a wholesale price index, and you can get a consumer price index. I would like to see statistics, uh, government statistics in, in this area broken down even more where we'd look at unemployment in the natural resource sector, unemployment in the manufacturing sector, unemployment in the wholesale sector, unemployment in the retail market. Uh, I think you'd learn a lot about the economy by looking at it in this fashion. Now, <clears throat> when I uh, my first chapter of the book is talks about what are what are we trying to achieve in studying economics? Uh, what is economics? And I basically focus on the idea of wealth creation and economic growth and improving and measuring standard of living. Um, and to me, that approach is much better than the traditional approach of choice and scarcity. I see choice and scarcity as, as kind of a subset of the whole concept of wealth creation. So my first, uh, first chapter uh, is uh, focusing on, on uh, how do we define wealth, what are we trying to achieve as economists in studying wealth creation or wealth destruction, because you can have both. Uh, and then I focus on... Uh, how we measure wealth, and I measure it basically using the criteria quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services. Quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services. And I have all kinds of, of um, <clears throat> methods for students to analyze this concept of quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services. One of the things that I do, for example, is ask students, I show them a, a chart on real wages. And if you show if you show a graph on real wages, it shows a declining standard of living since 1975. Almost all the charts show this. And you can dispute all uh, about this and, 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 uh, and have discussions on it. Uh, so a lot of people looking at real wages will come to the conclusion that standard of living has been declining for most Americans since 1975. However, when I give them this, when, when we talk about quantity, quality, and variety of goods and services, Almost every student comes to the opposite conclusion, that our standard of living has been rising since 1975. So it's, it's a valuable exercise to go through to be talking about how we measure standard of living and wealth and so on. And we can introduce uh, GDP at this point and, uh, as, as a measure, not the only measure, of, uh, of wealth creation. Uh, <clears throat> then... Uh, after I've discussed this concept of the goal, we always keep in mind this goal of, uh, of studying wealth creation. Uh, then we talk, well, how do we achieve this goal? So that's the logic of my system. Uh, we talk about what the goal is and how do we achieve the goal. And that's where I then introduce the four-stage model of the economy, which I've talked about here. And I basically show that the four stages of production are necessary in order to achieve wealth uh, because if, if uh, we, we talk about how natural resources in their natural state are basically unusable and no one can use iron ore or, or, or uh, uh, trees and what, 
what have you, until they are go through a whole series of stages of production to achieve uh, that final consumer goods and services that where, where we actually consume these things. So uh, I introduce uh, uh, everything uh, in terms of pointing down in this direction. In other words, here's our goal to increase, to, to achieve wealth creation. And we have these stages of production moving in a timely fashion toward that goal. Um, and uh, as a result, we can achieve our goal, which is the final uh, rectangle. And then I talk about land, labor, and capital. And uh, one of the things that I do, which I think is very unique in this approach, is I show that the uh, economic system, the market system, is actually, uh, uh, we often think of it as a competitive system, a dog-eat-dog -dog world and so on. And what I try to demonstrate with this uh, stage of production model is that it's very much a cooperative system. The capitalism is a cooperative system, not just a competitive system. It's actually both, but we often forget to develop the cooperative, the, the voluntary cooperative side of the market system. And so what I point out is that land, labor, and capital must work together at every stage of production in order to get to this final goal of wealth creation. And if they do not cooperate, you cannot achieve wealth creation. So... That's very different than the standard neoclassical model of land, labor, capital, and they're fighting over this economic pie, um, which I think is a, is a very bad way to teach economics, uh, but nevertheless is very much a part of, of standard modeling uh, when you don't develop this uh, time sequential stage of production approach, which allows you to introduce the concept that that uh, land, uh, that laborers and, and landlords and capitalists and entrepreneurs all have to work together. Okay, so uh, I do basically, uh, using this four-stage model, an overview, kind of a, 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 a macro overview of, of the economy. And then I introduce the, the second part of it is then I, I go to the micro section, the theory of the firm. And at that point, I do something which I think is very simple but very powerful for students to grasp the relationship between micro and macro. And starting again with this uh, four-stage model, I say, well, how, does the, how does the individual company or firm work uh, within this, this whole macro structure? And what I do then is develop a, a little micro two-stage model. Here's my two-stage model, if you can see this. Um, so what I've done is put ex expenditures on the top, expenses of a company on the top, and revenues on the bottom. And, and then the difference is the profit level, assuming this is a profitable firm. Uh, now... To get there, um, I first introduce the student to uh, a simple income statement. So you see, instead of supply and demand, uh, I'm, I'm into chapter probably five here. I have not introduced the supply and demand curves yet. Um, because I don't think it fits logically to immediately just start drawing supply and demand curves. I create the supply and demand curve out of an income statement that a business has. And what's nice about this is that students can relate to this immediately. Either they're business majors, and I understand uh, half of economics, uh, people who take introductory economics, are business majors. So when I give them an income statement, they can relate to it right away. And most other people know the basics of accounting, and you can, ex you can explain an income statement very pretty simply. And I use a, a real example. I use Microsoft uh, Corporation 1992 to show uh, their revenues, their expenditures, including the cost of capital, cost of materials. So you have uh, in total inputs, and then we have a net income or profit uh, listed there. And then on the next page, using the, a two-stage micro model of my macro economy, remember it was four stages, 
and uh, now I've got it down to two stages. It's basically the same kind of model where I have expen uh, expenses, revenues, and then you show the profit. Um, and what's nice about this method is that you can then show um, uh, what companies need to do. You can introduce the dynamics of a market economy. See, the problem with supply and demand curves is that you have a point of equilibrium and it's hard to show uh, why a firm would ever move away from that point of equilibrium when you're at equilibrium. You know, why don't you just keep producing the wedges? Wide, why do you want to always cut your costs? Why are you always looking for new products? How can you, how can you explain the dynamics of the world economy when you go into a, any grocery store or any Walmart and you'll notice that they're constantly trying out new products and you're seeing an increase in variety? Why is it that Procter & Gamble produces 60,000 different products? See, I can show this with this diagram. It's hard to show that with a supply and demand curve. And the way I show it is, um, we'll say, suppose Microsoft wants to introduce Windows 95 or, uh, or a new software package. Uh, what's the dynamics here? And the dynamics here is, well, we want to increase re uh, uh, revenues and uh, marginal revenues, and to what extent will the marginal cost increase as a result of that? And if marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost, then we have a profitable item and it's worth pursuing. If the marginal cost exceeds the marginal revenue, then you, you discard this new concept. So I have these, I have arrows moving the expenditures and, and, uh, and uh, expense, expenses and revenues up and down uh, showing the dynamics of the economy and why new products are constantly being introduced. I can also show downsizing very nicely with this graph. Why do corporations go through this downsizing process? And the whole idea is to cut expenditures more than you cut revenues because if you cut expenditure, you're probably going to cut revenues. But the question is, uh, you, you can introduce this marginality concept right away at the beginning level. Again, without any discussion of supply and demand, you can introduce marginal, uh, marginal principles here. So I like the dynamics of this very simple model, and uh, I go through a lot of different cases, downsizing, introducing new products, uh, and, and so forth, uh, and why, why, why companies have to constantly be vigilant on, on both their uh, ex uh, revenue side and their expenditure side. Another thing that's nice about this is that uh, a lot of companies as well as individuals make the mistake of just concentrating on their income side and not their expense side, and this shows why both, kind of like the scissors, you need both to develop the, uh, the concept there. Um, okay, so that's that's basically how I introduce uh, a micro, and and one of the one of the things I do here uh, is uh, I compare three companies: Walmart, Kmart, and Sears. And it's an interesting. I took 1992 as an example, and it's great because it shows Walmart uh, Walmart showing a substantial profit, Kmart was break even, and Sears was losing money. And what's nice then is you can sit down with your students and talk about, well, what can each one do to uh, improve their, their situation? And we talk about Sears and how they could uh, go through a variety of choices to, uh, to get back on an income level. Uh, again, I relate the micro to the macro. I say the, the macro model, you notice you have value added at each stage of production. And that's what you're trying to do on a micro level. Each firm is trying to add value. We stress add value. And we talk about to what extent is profitability a reflection of value added. And then we also talk about, well, when can companies engage in short-term uh, games to look like they're in, that where they're increasing their uh, quarterly profit earning statement when, in fact, they're not adding value. See, that's valuable, too, because you, then you can introduce the concepts of short-term versus long-term profitability and companies that give up long-term profitability for short-term profitability and vice versa. And you can talk about, we, I introduced the Japanese concepts of, of being very long-term, the, the Germans being very long-term, 
uh, in profitability, and a lot of times they give up short-term profitability in order to be long-term. So we can introduce those concepts too, uh, using uh, uh, these these basic basic concepts. Okay, uh, so now the question is, how do I introduce supply and demand uh, using uh, using these uh, this simple micro uh, system? And, and what I essentially do is uh, is take uh, the bottom revenue side, which basically re represents P times Q, to introduce the su uh, the ordinances of the, of the supply and demand curve, price and quantity. So, um, uh, so this is my first dot on a uh, uh, on a demand curve that I'm going to develop, basically showing this is the same thing as the revenue bar uh, in my micro model. So I've got one dot here with price and quantity for a particular product that Microsoft, in this case, Windows 95. Okay, and then. And then I talk about the decision-making process of choosing of, uh, uh, of choosing different prices. What if Microsoft raised the price of Windows 95 from 24.95 to 34.95? What would be the results? And so what I basically do is start getting points, and you can see how I develop my demand curve then right from the income statement, the revenue side of the income statement. And then I can do the same thing with the supply curve. That's the idea. So I get a supply and demand curve from the revenue portion of the income statement by using a certain assumptions and, and uh, that way developing a, uh, a, a, an equilibrium point uh, on, uh, using supply and demand from the revenue. And then the other thing that I do is, uh, and I've, I need to do that in the next chapter, the next chapter is I, I then have the cost. Uh, so you have supply and demand determining the price, but then you've got the cost revenue, uh, that, or the, uh, the cost or the expenditure side, which I also put on the supply and demand model, um, which is similar to what economists do with the average cost curve and the marginal cost curve. But I, I think that's an important principle to add that cost figure into the supply and demand uh, model so that you can show that there is this dynamic going on. A lot of, there's a lot of examples in the real world, and I don't know how most of you teach, when you teach economics, how you explain this, but a lot of, uh, a lot of pricing is cost-driven. Um, and uh, you, you see this all the time in, in the computer industry and uh, in other dynamic industries where the cost is reduced and reduced, and then they bring the price right down with it. And then you can show the profitability uh, increasing while that's happening. So by, by, by emphasizing the cost aspect, uh, you, can, you can show how uh, by cutting costs, it allows the firm to cut their prices and maintain mar um, market uh, um, uh, market share. And you'd be surprised how many companies emphasize market share as a reflection of uh, of controlling the, controlling the market. I've met with a number of firms that market share is more more important to them than profitability. Um, so it's these kind of practical things that I learn in in, in the business world, which I, I've tried to develop in my uh, economic model. So once I finish, uh, uh, well, let, let, me, let me go on to say that on the expenditure side, when I emphasize the expense side or the cost side, that's when I talk about factors of production. I have a chapter on, on wages and labor. I have a chapter on rent and land. I have a chapter on capital and interest. I have a chapter on entrepreneurship. So it all there's a logical step when I introduce the, exp the expense or cost side of the firm. That's when I introduce these ideas of land, labor, and capital as the factors of production. So that completes my micro section. And then I, and then I uh, go back to uh, the four-stage model of the economy, and then we talk about the macro side of it. 
I talk about GDP as a measure of uh, economic activity. Uh, but I do make an important difference in discussing GDP. And that is, I make a big point that GDP is, is only, uh, only reflects the output of final goods and services. So on my four-stage model, it's only the last stage that represents GDP. And the other stages earlier are very important and should not be ignored. So I have created a new economic uh, statistic called uh, 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 GDO, Gross Domestic Output, which is a uh, represents uh, all spending in the economy. Is it double, double counting? Yes, it is double counting. But it's like you take all the sales of all corporations and you add it all together. And that's an important statistic. Uh, because it indicates a uh, total amount of, of uh, ex expenditure or spending that goes on in the economy. And when you do that, uh, you find out that, that the, the, uh, uh, the total capital investment is substantially larger than consumption. And, and that's valuable because we, uh, uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, there's a lot of error, I think, in the thinking that we're a consumer-driven society, uh, that consumption is the biggest part of the economy, when in fact it is not. The, uh, the uh, stages of production leading up to final consumption is substantially larger uh, if you include investment uh, with that. So this first uh, graph here, if you want to... Uh, or a chart, if you pass that around, you can see what I'm doing. This is for 1986. I haven't updated it, but at least you get an idea of what I would be showing in my textbook. Uh, you know, normally what happens is that everything starts here with gross national or gross domestic product, the middle graph. You've all seen those kind of uh, uh, charts or bar charts before. But I start earlier, if you'll notice, in the first, uh, the first bar um, there I have uh, my gross national output or gross domestic output and it includes this gross intermediate product which is the earlier stages of production and I put that in there uh, to demonstrate how, how big the economy is in, ter in terms of total spending uh, so I, I find that this, this is an easy way to explain my, my concept of G GDO or GNO uh, and uh, does it is helpful to give a perspective of how big the economy is and where economic activity is taking place. It's a mistake to focus only on final output of goods and services. And so this would be a, uh, a, a considerable change in the national income accounting section of my textbook with the addition of this additional concept of, of GDO or GNO. Uh, the other thing that I try to do is introduce the concept of, uh, of economic growth very early in the macro section. Um, and uh, I think this is an area where uh, most textbooks have fallen down. Economic growth is usually in the back of the textbook under international comparisons and all this sort of thing. But I like to put it right up front because it, it, it falls back on this concept that we're looking for wealth creation and standard of living and economic growth is very much a part of that. And that brings up the, uh, the second uh, handout there. If we could hand that out. Uh, uh, this is an excellent way to contrast uh, my approach versus um, the... Uh, let me have an extra one if there's, if there's one too. Thank you. Um, did you get one of those here? I've, I've got one right here in there. Oh, here we go. You got one? Okay. Uh, you'll see uh, the, the first model is the standard Keynesian model that was in Samuelson's textbook for many years. And it really does form the, you've all seen the circular flow diagram. That's essentially what you have there is the circular flow diagram, which is in all the textbooks and still used as the circular flow diagram is the way the, our economy works. 
And of course, in this case, he has uh, uh, Samuelson has savings leaking out and hopefully coming back in the form of investment. But there's the connection is is questionable. Uh, while the second model, which I uh, discovered uh, in uh, Paul Eakins' book, Professor Paul Eakins at University of London, he's a very uh, um, very pro environmentalist economist who would who would shudder to think that a free market Austrian economist was using his model. Uh, and but I. I thank God the day I discovered this this uh, this uh, graph here because uh, and it's, I think one of the reasons to uh, uh, I always make the case that it's valuable to read people you don't agree with and this is an example of it where this guy had this brilliant uh, uh, flow diagram here which to me is far more eloquently presenting what, how the economy really does work. And I, I, I play a game here by calling consumption leakage just to make it in contrast with Samuelson. I, I certainly would not regard consumption as leakage. Uh, it is what we call utility or welfare, as we've got up here. Like here. But it, I, I really like this bottom graph uh, flow chart because it demonstrates the importance of investment, how critical investment is in driving the economy rather than consumption driving the economy, which is what the above chart does and which is what the the uh, normal circular flow diagram does. It's, it's very much uh, spending is what really matters. And here down below it's, it demonstrates very clearly that it's capital formation investment that drives the economy and drives economic growth. So I like the dynamics of this lower model, and this is what I use in, in my textbook with, with full credit to Paul Eakins for coming up with this. Um, and then you have land, labor, and capital, and emphasizing how each one of those can be improved to uh, develop the economic process. The, the, um, the diamond economic process there is basically my four-stage production model that I would insert right in that point. Um, so I like that in demonstrating the dynamics. And then the final section of my textbook deals with government policy, uh, monetary policy, uh, fiscal policy, uh, tax policy, um, in, uh, in how it affects this, this model. Um, and uh, so that completes the concept, uh, the, the basic structure of my textbook. But I believe it does qualify with the objectives I originally had in mind of starting in a logical fashion and moving in a way that people, uh, students will walk away saying, yes, I, I now understand how the economy works uh, using these kind of uh, methods. Uh, there is a lot of interest in my textbook, uh, primarily among uh, smaller schools. I've gotten, uh, I have over 50 uh, professors of economics who have reviewed my first six chapters and sent me all kinds of notes uh, on how to improve it. Uh, my objective is to get a mainstream publisher. Um, um, I have uh, Irwin, which is quite interested in the uh, textbook project, and uh, also Harper Collins. Uh, Roger Leroy Miller, who is not an Austrian, uh, really likes my textbook. Uh, and what I've tried to do in this textbook is not ever call it Austrian per se. I present it as, as a logical way to explain economics. But people will wonder when the... Uh, the first, the first chapter, I, well, I highlight a, a, a different economist in each a chapter. And uh, the, the first chapter is Adam Smith, so that's, that's not controversial. Because uh, he was, you know, his book was uh, Wealth of Nations, so that fits in. But this, the next chapter is called The Fundamentals of Economic Behavior. And who do you think I have for that one? Uh, Ludwig von Mises. So Mises is uh, the, the second economist after Adam Smith in my book. Um, so, and, but I do plan to have a, a full biography. When I have the, the section on labor, I'll probably have Karl Marx as the economist and talk about him and stuff. But um, 
Uh, my intention is to have uh, have a textbook that can be acceptable uh, as a uh, as a textbook that will give the basics of supply and demand and everything that economists currently teach, uh, but in a much broader way so that these Austrian principles can develop it. And I also think I'm having a lot of uh, business students read the textbook to make sure it fits in nicely with with uh, accounting majors. Uh, and so far, the, the accountants really like it, although when I use the term working capital, one of my uh, accountant friends, just he said, Skousen, I don't know what economists mean by working capital, but this is not it. Because you know, working capital is quite a different, has quite a different meaning in accounting than it does for economists. So that's, that's valuable information for me to make sure I don't make those kinds of mistakes. Working capital is not actually used that much anymore by economists, but, but uh, I used it in my textbook and used it very much differently than, than the accountants. So that, that sort of thing is valuable. Um, I've been told that, uh, that uh, the uh, textbook publishers spend a million dollars of their own capital in developing a market for a new textbook. So they're, they're pretty uh, difficult to deal with. Uh, you know, they want to make sure they can get a lot of sales. So one of the reasons I'm speaking to a number of, of colleges and universities about this idea is to try to engender support, trying to get professors to say, this is a textbook I could adopt. And that's going to be helpful to have a, a series of letters like that to give to the uh, uh, to the publishers to say I think there's going to be demand here. They, they frankly said that that you've got to be able to guarantee at least fifteen thousand to uh, to start fifteen thousand in sales in adoptions before they will really consider it. So that's that's a pretty uphill battle, and I probably end up self-publishing or getting Phillips Publishing, my newsletter publisher, to publish it. They, they publish my uh, investments uh, lectures. Uh, and I may start off that way. And, and uh, I just think it's going to take some time because it, the textbook approach is very different. And it's going to require a different uh, way of presenting the material. Um, so I, I'm, I recognize that it's an uphill battle for me to get this published by a mainstream publisher, but that's my goal anyway. So that's basically what I wanted to present. Uh, and if you have some questions or comments or criticisms, I would be glad to uh, to hear them. Yes? Yeah, that, that's a good point. Uh, in my macro section, uh, uh, I, I probably will not. I, I, I considered at one time to introduce uh, the aggregate supply and aggregate demand curves that the, uh, that come out of Keynesian economics, but I felt uh, that that would confuse the student. I am going to have an appendix on the Keynesian cross and a little bit on Keynesian economics. I've decided to do that, but I think aggregate supply and aggregate demand is so far wrong. In, uh, in a, uh, that it's best to just drop it and not have it in there in the first place. And that's another reason it probably won't be adopted. Uh, I do have my own form of aggregate <coughs> supply and aggregate demand, uh, which I introduce in my structure production book. And I don't know how many of you have seen that, but it actually, uh, uh, it's a little bit difficult to explain to students. Uh, I don't know if any of you have tried to, explain the, uh, my vector. It's kind of a vector analysis. Um, so it's a little bit advanced. Uh, but I think that, that it's best to just... I've, I've decided to be pretty hardcore on my textbook. While still trying to get the mainstream to adopt it, I, I'm not going to put things in there I just don't believe. I'm just not going to do it. So given that kind of situation, uh, that, that does lessen my chance of being published. But Paul Hain did a pretty good job of publishing his textbook. Uh, he did introduce aggregate supply and demand in one of his editions, and then he dropped it in the next one. His latest edition doesn't have it. So I, I think you can publish a uh, textbook without compromising your principles, but most 
most professors do compromise their principles. And I mean, I talked to Roger Leroy Miller, and he says, "Oh, I put in the aggregates fine, man, but this is BS, and no, I don't really believe it, and I don't know anyone who does." And and I said, "Well, Roger, why do you put it in there?" And he said, "Well, because uh, I I'm selling textbooks." And well, you know, as you know, the the textbook market changes so slowly because people change their classroom tactics or antics so slowly. And, there, you know, people want to teach aggregate supply and aggregate demand, and so that's what people are uh, <laughs> there's given. There's no doubt it's fulfilling the customer's desire, mm -hmm. and the customer is the professor, the not teacher. necessarily the student, right. but um, indirectly the student because they, they can at least have some idea of mm -hmm. what it's all about. Uh, but I don't believe in it, and uh, and the profession is gradually shifting on that. If you saw the uh, Colander piece on uh, aggregate supply and aggregate demand, where, where did that appear, Roger? Journal of Economic Perspective. Yeah, the, in the JEP. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it, so I think I think it, uh, we need to discourage its use as much as possible. Well, and the textbooks have changed, as you you know yeah. you've been following the, the textbook market. Uh, you know, a lot of the Samuelsonian and Keynesian aspects about uh, liquidity traps yeah. and all that kind of stuff is but now... They haven't changed in that respect. They've gone the hard, more hardcore with aggregate supply and aggregate demand. But, um, but certain features like the liquidity trap and the accelerators and all yeah, that that's stuff gone. is... Um, and uh, I really... Uh, actually, I'm, I'm uh, Mancu's uh, macro text. I don't know how many of you have looked at that, but it starts, you know, with the classical model. And the Keynesian model is at the end, and it's almost in reading it. Uh, Menke is uh, is uh, I mean, you, you're sitting there reading this, and and he's actually got better. He's more. He has more fervor regarding the first beginning part of the chapter, beginning part of the textbook. And I'm kind of hoping his new textbook is supposed to be out this year. This one that he was paid. Uh, four million dollars advance or whatever it was. I mean it was an outrageous advance for a economics textbook. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Very I have a feeling that he's going to do the same thing. He's going to start with the classical model. Um, and uh, that's that's an, Im an impressive change. And then at the end of course he introduces uh, the short-term model of Keynesian economics and the aggregate supply and demand curves. But it's the beginning part, which I think students are going to more easily grasp. Uh, and with unemployment as low as it is in the United States, uh, the emphasis is going to be on long-term equilibrium. So I like I like what he's doing there. It's quite different than what I'm doing here, but still, it's it's a movement away from the Keynesian episode, as Leland called it. <laughs> Oh, you, he, well, that's true, yes. What do you call it? Keynesian diversion. Keynesian diversion. That was your phrase. Yes. Um, it seemed to me, listening to you talk, and you're trying to talk about the practical business aspects and using the income statement. Uh, this is sort of a lot of what I think mainstream would consider managerial economics mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. How do we use economics you know, principles in businesses? How do we see them being applied to businesses? Um, Maybe thought at all about maybe trying to work into that niche a little bit. Uh, I do have a lot of management. Uh, managerial books. My my approach in economics is to include a lot of management, marketing, uh, as well as pure economics, uh, business, corporate structure, and I also have a chapter on finance, which I think is very important on uh, stocks and bonds and, and uh, corporate finance, which economics in large measure does a very poor job in, in developing. While you talk to Friedman and so on, and he still argues is kind of a cons casino aspect of the markets. I don't think he really understands the role of capital, and the Chicago School has, has always been, uh, uh, their emphasis on capital has been low. Uh, it's kind of funny though because uh, uh, um, Friedman considers the best chapter in his price theory book his chapter on capital. <laughs> and it's so standard, neoclassical capital, uh, you know, capital and interest rate <clears throat> kind of stuff. One of the things that 
going through this discussion and the layout of the book that uh, I noted that is there's two basic types of students that you're going to get in an economics class, mm -hmm. uh, the very few who actually understand it and get something out of the material, and then the vast majority who don't. And who are there just to get a... Well, and they, they, they really don't get the, you know, the essence of economics and really understand what's really generating the economic process and, and all that kind of stuff. And the people who get it um, tend to be the people who uh, have experience in the market. They, they already have felt the competitive pressures and the balance sheet and the supply, or not supply and demand, but revenues and expenses and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. People who have that kind of experience tend to latch on to the economic principles much quicker uh, when you take the standard you know, approach of starting out with supply and demand and then going on from there. And I think that, you know, that, that may be the... Uh, that may be a big benefit if you're dealing with a standard student who really doesn't have any economic experience, really doesn't know much more than the names of these companies, um, to work them through some of the real business aspects mm -hmm. before they actually get to supply and demand. Because I think that's the real, uh, the, the fact that most classes, most approaches in textbooks really don't get to the students because they don't have the experience necessary to understand the underlying forces of supply and demand. Well, I have a, I, I, I have a whole appendix, even though I, I introduce an income statement, ba very basic income statement, mm -hmm. and then I have an appendix on, uh, on accounting. But most textbooks do that as well, but I integrate it more, and I put it up much at, near the beginning mm -hmm. of the of the course, and so a number of my uh, colleagues have said, uh, "You really are writing a business economics textbook or a managerial economics textbook," and and, and I think that's because they haven't seen the entire book, uh, where I I do start off that way, but I, I have a lot of pure economics that comes in, especially on the macro section at uh, at the end. The uh, your gross domestic output. Uh Statistic: The uh, Investors Business Daily reviewed that very mm -hmm. favorably, um, and I think it it really does tell you a lot more about the economy because you're looking at all the sectors of the economy rather than um, just final output. But in terms of the Austrian theory of the business cycle, do you think it improves or or is doesn't really do anything in terms of telling us where we are in the cycle and, and that sort of thing? Well, does it give I, you any better information? Yeah, I think it does because uh, uh, what I try to do is uh, uh, when I come to a ch I have a chapter on the business cycle, and what I do is try to disaggregate the economy according to these time these stages of production. So, uh, in looking at instead of just looking at the unemployment rate, mm -hmm. and what we try to look at or the employment total employment, that also. We try to look at each sector, like the natural resource sector, or the manufacturing sector, what kind of statistics we have on those, and to see where is the boom actually taking place, where is the bust actually taking place. Uh, and so we don't look at just the consumer price index, we will we'll look at commodity price index. And if the commodity price index is just skyrocketing, that's an indication of a boom the early stages of the boom. Mm -hmm. So I do try to look at uh, these sectors uh, of the economy to to determine where we are in the business cycle and to what extent government uh, is encouraging or, or causing the boom to take place and how far along is it. Mm -hmm. So it has a lot of predictive power as well, in my opinion, uh, and that's what I try to do there um, on, uh, on the business cycle. Of course, now these statistics aren't very good, and I wanted to ask you how you come down on the uh, CPI debate because you've got the you know pe half the people or most of the people saying the CPI overestimates inflation, and then a lot of people say it underestimates inflation. And, and yeah. so, I mean, uh, if you're using these statistics in class, there's also the question of how good are the statistics? Yeah, and and I think the statistics on a relative basis are pretty good. Uh, in other words. If they're all using the same methodology, uh, the error rate is fairly equalized, is what I, I would estimate. Uh, I, you know, Friedman and others, I've gone the rounds with them on this. Uh, I, I think that 
they do have a, a good point about quality changes and things like that as far as the CPI. And in that sense, maybe it does overestimate prices. But on the other hand, the CPI is a poor indicator of cost of living. There's a bit, I would like to see a cost of living index rather than a CPI. Mm -hmm. And that's harder to judge. But, for example, it leaves out, generally leaves out taxation. The only time taxes play a role in the CPI is if you have an increase in the sales tax, then that can be reflected in the CPI. But like a change in real estate or, in, or especially income taxes is not uh, not included, and that can be 30 percent of your cost of living could be taxes. So uh, cost of living, uh, if we had a cost of living index, I think it would be substantially higher than the CPI. So uh, I, I have a section in my textbook that I plan to write on this, and that would be my main my main point there. Well, we only have about one minute left for the no. seminar time, so I wanted to get you uh, an opportunity to uh, to do some predicting about where we are in the cycle and <laughs> where we're going. Aha, uh -huh. so that's, that's okay. what you're leading up to. Well, I actually think that uh, uh, the that we are moving into an inflationary uh, boom phase. Um, and you, you see that in terms of the, the unemployment rate falling as far as it has the Fed reluctant to raise interest rates, so that's creating an artificial boom. Um, money supply is loosening again. It, there was a period it was tightening, now it's loosening again. And if you look at M2, that's the rate is going up. Now, these are many inflationary booms, though, compared to the 70s, so you always have to keep that in mind. And the inflation is is uh, making its appearance in assets not in, and not in consumer prices. Because the consumer price uh, market is very competitive and it's global. So there's, CPI is not going to be moving up much. So that's not what you watch. What you watch is financial assets, particularly stocks. Stocks are where the, the new money, the extra money is going into. And I'm, I'm very bullish on all those markets. But it's headed for, uh, it, it'll be a major correction here uh, at some point. I think it'll be sharp, treacherous, and it'll be very hard to predict when it will happen. So I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not into market timing like I used to. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because even though government is playing its business cycle game and tight money, easy money, and all that sort of thing, um, this uh, worldwide global free market expansion that I've been seeing over the last, well, since the collapse of the Berlin Wall. I mean, I traveled a lot, and uh, I was over in Europe, um, was down in Latin America, uh, been to a number of places in the last uh, three or four months, and the demand for U.S. goods is, is really remarkable. I mean, I went into a mall in Santiago, Chile, and I thought I was stateside. I mean, they, they had... Uh, the Gap and Rockford Shoes and, and McDonald's and uh, and everybody spoke English and uh, it, 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 it was just mind-boggling. And uh, these were goods that were not produced in Chile. They were produced in the United States or produced outside the United States by U.S. companies. Um, so that's why I, uh, all these, uh, there's no such thing as a U.S. Uh, stock market anymore. All markets uh, are global, um, so uh, I'm 100% I'm invested in global stocks at the present time. Not bonds, because the bond market, that's, that game is over to make money on bonds. I would not recommend anybody playing the bond market. 7%, uh, interest rates will probably be rising in this mini inflationary boom. Stocks can continue to rise also, though. Uh, uh, my prediction is that when the 1990s are over, the, this decade of the 1990s will statistically probably be the best return on stocks ever of the 20th century. So I'm not into market timing, 100% invested, uh, but in stocks, not bonds. Well, as in bonds, as in the seminar time, we are all up with time, and uh, we've got some students and some instructors who have to get to their next class. So I want to thank you, Mark, for coming. It's thank you. Great pleasure.